I'm Edward Warfield. I'm the publisher, publisher of CityBiz, and I'm honored today to interview Mark Skapoff, who is a business bankruptcy lawyer at Royer, Cooper, Cohen, and Brownfield in their New York office. Mark was recently elected president of the Turnaround Management Association, uh, New York chapter. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Can you highlight your academic and le legal career pr prior to joining the, your new firm? Sure. So uh, kind of law was a second career for me. So uh, the, the first path uh, I was an academic one. So um, I was a, a political science major undergrad at, at Carleton College and then went to a PhD program at uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill. Uh, my primary area of study was in comparative politics, um, particularly seeing this was, this was 1989. So uh, I started off studying Latin America, but things got a little exciting in other parts of the world in 1989. Um, and so I sort of switched my focus to uh, transitions to democracy in, in uh, Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And as, as part of that, um, I applied for and got a, a Fulbright grant uh, after my master's thesis for my dissertation um, in 94, 95 to, to study sort of the development of civil society and transitions to democracy in Poland. So for, for that entire calendar year, uh, I was living in Warsaw and doing research, um, but mostly because it was a very sort of transitional time there, uh, hanging out in a lot of uh, pubs and things like that, where uh, at any given time, there would be members of parliament and judges and Polish lawyers, but and then an assortment of sort of US academics and think tank people and, and whatever. And over beers, literally, we would sort of uh, like draft the constitution for Poland, or, you know, they would show us drafts like, you know, should we do it this way? Should we do it that way? What, what do you guys do? And so it, it, was, it was pretty exciting. Um, but it was also exciting because uh, there was a practical component to it. And uh, it was at the time of privatization and everything else. So American companies were coming in. And what I sort of realized was, is I would sort of rather be doing it than writing about other people doing it. Um, and so w when I got back to the States, I was sort of, you know, had this monster in a box of a, of a draft <laughs> dissertation. Uh, but I was sort of like, I do I really want to spend the rest of my life doing this? And the answer was no. And so then I did the next thing, which is what, what do you do with a political science degree? And you're not good at math. And it was, well, I'll go to law school. So, so that, that, that's what I did. Um, and so in 97, I, I started at law school sort of as a, you know, a little older non-traditional student, uh, Washington University in St. Louis and graduated in, in 2000 and started at uh, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Wharton, and Garrison. So you can tell us about your decision to join uh, Royer Cooper Co. and Brownfeld? Certainly. So that, that was sort of a decision that, that did, didn't come lightly and kind of was years in the making. So, so like I said, I, I started at Paul Weiss in New York um, in, I was a summer associate in 1999 and I worked there for, for about four years and moved, moved to Ro Ropes and Gray for another four or five years and then Jones Day for a couple of years and then at Baker Hostetler for, for another stint. And, and at some point, um, it, it just became apparent that sort of big law um, was becoming sort of a rather kind of commodified kind of business where in, in some sense, like actually rolling up your sleeves uh, and practicing law and interacting with clients and doing those things sort of became secondary to, you know, uh, how many hours, what are your originations, things like that. Um, and I, I just sort of felt like I didn't, didn't have a lot of autonomy or flexibility because of conflicts and, and other kind of stuff. So uh, my partner uh, with me in the bankruptcy group there, Mark Hirschfeld, uh, whom I had been with at, at Ropes and Gray before, we, you know, we decided um, we, want, we want to do something different. And 
uh, you know, we contacted a headhunter and she reached out and placed us with various firms and we'd go and we'd visit them and we'd go and we'd leave and we'd go, well, that was a law firm. And, and it was like, what are we doing? But then we got this intriguing uh, note from the recruiter that uh, this small Philadelphia firm, uh, at the time only about 20, 22 lawyers, Roy Cooper, Cohen, Bronfeld was interested in opening an office in New York and would be interested in talking to them. And, you know, we were like, sure, never hurts to talk to anybody, but we honestly didn't think it would really go anywhere. I mean, we're, we're at 1,200 lawyer Baker Hostetler go, talking 20 person shop in Philadelphia. And so we were supposed to meet uh, Neil Cooper and Roger Bronfeld down at, at Keene's. And we're walking down there and thinking like, well, at least, you know, we'll get a big mutton chop out of this and, you know, it'll, it'll be fine. And we got there and, and uh, Neil was, uh, was there. I, excuse me, Roger was there. Neil was late because the train was late. And we just started talking. And if you've ever met Roger, you'll know he's, he's very magnetic. And we sort of instantly got hooked on this thing. And we were like, wow, this, this is exciting. This is interesting. It ended up being like a three or four hour lunch. Um, and, you know, two, two months later, we were opening the New York office um, of Royer Cooper. Uh, and now we are up to 60 lawyers almost. Uh, we, we have five lawyers in New York when we started with two. And so, you know, it, it's been quite a success story and, and you know, a, a pretty amazing experience. So can you tell us a little bit about your, your practice, your bankruptcy practice? Like most bankruptcy people, uh, we are generalists um, because uh, I, I didn't want to have to make that decision sort of when you start at a law firm, like the basic thing is, are you a litigator or are you a corporate person? And if you want to do both, you're a bankruptcy lawyer. So, you know, I like to, to do the mix of the transactional and litigation work. And so my practice reflects that. So I do all the traditional kind of bankruptcy court things and representing debtors or creditors committees, uh, being involved in bankruptcy litigation, whether it's, you know, fraudulent transfer litigation or, or you know, priority of liens or those kinds of things. But I also have uh, a fairly um, extensive sort of debt finance practice. Um, so, you know, I represent lenders or borrowers just in regular loans and commercial transactions. Um, I represent sort of uh, issuers or underwriters and sort of structuring bankruptcy remote financing transactions and sort of parlayed the, the sort of flexibility and doesn't like conform to a cookie cutter kind of thing of bankruptcy it, into areas that are kind of new where there aren't a lot of rules of the road. So uh, at Royer Cooper, for example, we, we have a pretty thriving cannabis practice. Uh, that, that was something that we were not allowed to do um, at my previous firm, even though we had a Denver office. Um, at Royer Cooper, we were not restricted by that kind of things. And when you look at a cannabis company, it, it looks a lot like potentially, even, even if it's doing well, sort of a distressed company in terms of the fact that you're not quite sure what the rules of the road are. Everything is kind of up in flux and, and, you know, both on the investor or the company side, you're not necessarily sure what, what your drafting is going to stick or anything like that. And so being able to sort of not be uh, distressed by all that uncertainty as, as sort of a more out of the box kind of corporate lawyer or transaction lawyer may be just, you know, we just kind of walk into it and go, okay, okay, this is messy. Like, how are we going to do this? Like, we can't, can't get a lien because of this. Well, let's figure out another way to get the equivalent of it. And it, it's that aspect of the, of the practice, you know, that, that sort of keeps me excited when I get up in the morning. And so what have been the challenges over the last year in, in terms of your bankruptcy practice uh, in dealing with COVID-19 and the pandemic? I mean, clearly like, like every, everyone else, I mean, the, the challenges have been uh, in, enormous. Um, and while, while we have been very busy uh, addressing people's concerns, whether it's landlords because tenants can't pay or it's tenants because they can't pay their landlords, 
um, or you know, businesses struggling to figure out if they're eligible for CARES Act funds or the small business thing. We, we've been very busy and, and on top of all that. But, but also, you know, it'd be sort of remiss to say that, you know, uh, there, there have been some, you know, not, not so great outcomes for clients through, through no fault of their own. So Mark, what challenges and trends do you see in bankruptcy for 2021? The challenges for 2021, unfortunately, are looking a lot like the challenges for 2020. Although I think with potentially uh, some parties being less patient than, than they were before. But right now we're sort of in a dynamic. And, and if you look at the filings, you could see there have not been a lot of bankruptcy filings in the last four or five months, sort of after that big early wave, especially of retail bankruptcies. But things have not changed in the sense of if, if your business involves someone physically having to be in your location to purchase your good or service, you're in trouble. And your landlord or mortgage lender is in trouble. And we're in a dynamic where, and this is sort of an old bankruptcy joke, where it's sort of like if one borrower gets in trouble with the bank, it's the borrower's problem. If all the borrowers are in trouble, it's the bank's problem. Um, because the banks don't want to be in the business of running companies, especially in this market, and they don't want to repossess the equipment and the collateral and do all that kind of thing. So right now, between the, the, the federal funds that are available, the extension of the CARES Act, uh, the Fed, you know, qualitative easing program, sort of buying up securities, propping up the market, um, there's still a lot of liquidity out there. And uh, it's not really, I think, until we're sort of post-COVID and, and people are back at whatever the new normal is and we'll know when we see it, that the haves and the have-nots are really going to separate themselves. I mean, I, I think if you're familiar with the term zombie companies, which which gets used a lot, that, they have been around for a while, but that phenomenon has just continued. So you have companies that have a ton of debt on their balance sheet, but they can service their interest. The bank doesn't have an interest in foreclosing or doing anything else. Uh, they're more than willing to sort of extend the loan for a fee because they'll get a fee because they're not making any money on the interest on the loans now. Uh, and the companies kind of limp along. Um, and so you don't see a lot of stuff happening in bankruptcy because the, the companies don't have to file. Like they, they survive, but, but they're not in a position to thrive. And so I think myself and, and most people in the field, you know, see... At some point, there has to be sort of a, a wave of consolidations, liquidations, et cetera, some, something that clears the market. Now, 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 with that said, none of us are used to operating in this sort of, you, we can print as much money as we want and have negative interest rates, and yet there's no inflation. And that paradigm doesn't fit the traditional models about when you should see companies needing to file for bankruptcy or anything else. So, you know, the, the bottom line on that is there's liquidity out there uh, and there are investors just clamoring for returns. And you have a very liberal Federal Reserve that seems willing to sort of backstop that. Um, when that music stops, if it ever stops, yeah, I, I, I don't, it could, could be awful. It, it, could be okay. We don't know, but that's sort of the market that we live in now. That that sort of seems a little unmoored from from the traditional finance and sort of macroeconomic assumptions we we all used to live by. So you were recently appointed president of the Turnaround Management Association of New York. Can you tell us about that organization and the what your vision of the next steps for that? Sure. So, so TMA, Turnaround Management Association, is a global association. We have about 60 chapters internationally in the U.S., 10,000 or so members of, you know, what we call turnaround professionals, um, which is sort of broadly speaking, sort of the world of, of bankruptcy and structure, restructuring and solvency, but, but more and more now, even just things like uh, disruption, whether it's uh technological disruption that all of a sudden 
you know, automates a plant uh, uh, so you don't need employees or involves changes to supply chains or, or things like that. And it's a place for lawyers, bankers, you know, capital providers, accountants to, to all sort of be together in, in one room, um, not only for business referral, obviously, and networking, but, but also to sort of look at the entire sort of holistic picture of, of, of a distressed or not so healthy company and, and sort of map out like how, how are we going to fix this thing? Um, and, and I think uh, COVID ha has, has proven an interesting thing because we are a business and, you know, in the business, the TMA chapter, like any others, albeit, you know, it's a nonprofit and a trade association. But, but I remember we had a very large event, but almost 200 people on March 9th. I remember the day. Uh, in retrospect, probably should not have had that. Um, and I think on March 12th, the mayor of New York said, uh, everybody go home and stay home. And so all of a sudden we were left with, oh, okay, what, what do we do now? And I, I think everyone quickly came together and we sort of looked at it and this is what I've been pushing and what I've been pushing, you know, as sort of president just, just starting for this year. Uh, this represents an opportunity. Uh, this is a disruption, clearly. Um, but we do this every day for our clients. We, we, we figure out how do you navigate through uncharted waters while preserving value or maximizing value or, you know, getting from A to B with, with sort of the, the least pain as possible. And so we were really good, I think, and, and we turned on a dime uh, from, from being a very much face-to-face -face based organization with networking events and others to, to putting on online programming, whether it was educational or frankly, uh, just sort of networking entertaining like we, we've done virtual scavenger hunts mm -hmm. and wine tastings and and various other things to keep the the community and our, and our membership engaged so that that's what we're planning to do more of in 2021 with a view towards get, getting back to the more regular schedule but you know my, my vision for the chapter in 2021 is is to continue that outreach and engagement uh, to our membership. And, and so far it's been, I, I have to say it's successful. We, we were worried like other organizations going into this year that you know, sponsors would not be really willing uh, to step up because you know, they, they don't have the conferences with their names on them or things like that. But we, we've actually exceeded our goal in terms of what we picked for budgeting for sponsorship. And we've offered our sponsors uh, tremendous opportunities to, to do online programming. In fact, we, we created uh, a new online programming committee separate from our regular programming. And that's enabled us to hit the ground running this year. So we have a event next week that's sort of a, a state of the union on, on the debt markets with managing directors from places like Rothschild and FTI and Skadden. <laughs> but then our women's chapter is having a pizza making event, you know, a couple of weeks after that, where we send, they get everything sent in the mail and the, the flour and sauce and stuff. So we're doing a, a diversity inclusion event with the Chicago chapter in February with the global, global diversity inclusion officer of Skadden Arps, um, some major lenders, uh, you know, other, other folks in corporate America. So, we, we are looking at this year, and I, I'm encouraging everyone to look at this year as uh, a challenge, but also a way to sort of get rid of the old stuff and figure out what the new stuff is. And some of it will stick and some of it won't, and, and that's okay. Um, because as long as we're moving forward and retaining members, we're doing a good job. And we'll make mistakes along the way, but we'll learn from those and incorporate them and, and continue to move forward. So are there any other thoughts, insights uh, that you'd like to share with us before we close it out? I mean, thoughts and insights, yeah. I, I mean, I, what I'm hoping for is, you know, not only with a new administration that has some uh, experience with bankruptcy and other things, uh, um, Biden was uh, one of the folks who was instrumental, actually, in some of the, the bankruptcy reforms uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, it didn't really take too well 
um, in, in retrospect, uh, where they sort of tilted the deck a little bit to too much to the creditor side, I think. Um, I, I think this is an opportunity to revisit like what what a bankruptcy system can do to revive and reorganize companies so that people still can be entrepreneurial and you know not afraid to fail. So one good thing that's come out of this is uh, the new CARES Act that came out extends the um, small business new subchapter five bankruptcy with sort of the higher debt thresholds to be eligible. That was set to expire in February. That that's being renewed, and and it's our hope that that will sort of be made permanent. And and frankly, that they raise the debt level a little bit, so that your middle market company with 15 or 20 million dollars of debt uh, can reorganize, and so the owners can stay with the company. And you know, you can actually use the process to do something more than really be for the benefit of a, of a secured lender, uh, which in a lot of ways it's turned out to be. Well, I want to thank you, Mark, for sharing your thoughts and insights, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. In a, uh, I'm, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies in the future, so I think you're in a, uh, I think you're in a good spot. Right. Thank you for thank your time. You. Thank you.